Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of Teaching with Inquiry Live. Tonight, I want to talk about the stuff that's inside the sandwich when we're talking about inquiry. And we're going to look at what kind of happens in between that initial provocation that I know we've talked a lot about through often with a provocation activity, using Wonder Wall cards or putting things up on a Wonder Wall. And then finishing it off with an inquiry project at the end, tonight we're going to talk about some of the things that you can do in the middle in between those two things. So what you can get done between the Wonder Wall and the independent inquiry project at the end and kind of what the learning looks like in the middle of our inquiry journey. So I'm going to share with you a few of my favorite activities that I often are my go-to activities that I will use with students. So looking at this from Inquiry to Wonderwall, I have a few slides for you to look at. So the first one is we've talked a lot about what the provocation is. Now this is what I'm often starting Inquiry with. If I am starting with a whole bunch of images or real life objects and I'm throwing them in the middle of my carpet and I'm simply asking three questions. What do you see? What do you notice? And what do you wonder? And from there, my students are going to be coming up with questions. And then with those questions, I will sort those questions. And from there, we will post that up on our bulletin board, which then becomes our wonder wall. And then we take that there and look at their questions, sort through those questions, group them, and then that turns into our success criteria. That's the beginning, and that is our starting point and our journey. So this is just a photo of the very first step where it's a complete mess. You've got photos everywhere. You've got kids grabbing at different things, sharing what they're wondering, recording what they see, and really trying to activate some of that prior knowledge that they might have and really building that into place. And then you take all of that information that went from absolute chaos on your carpet and you organize this into your wonder wall. So we have talked about this plenty of times in other videos and I will make sure that I link you to those in the notes and in the comment section so that you can see some of the other videos where I specifically walk you through how to put that wonder wall together, how to make those boards and what they look like and how to get to that point. So let's move on into what your inquiry journey is going to look like after you have done this initial step in your journey. So if this is the first time you're joining us on Teaching with Inquiry Live, thank you very much for joining me. I am so happy that you are here. We go live every single Monday night at 9 o'clock to talk about teaching and teaching with inquiry and all the other parts of that big, huge puzzle piece that helps us to figure out as teachers how to fit it all together. And I am Patty and I am a four or five teacher here in Ontario and I come live and talk about how I fit it all together and share my journey with you, hoping that that will give you some ideas and inspiration for yourselves, especially if you're feeling pretty stuck. So again, tonight we're talking about what we're going to do between this wonder wall and that inquiry project and what learning looks like in the in-between section. So I just want to go over what generally speaking inquiry that in-between stuff kind of covers. And for me, it's always guided by student interest. So that Wonderwall activity that I just showed you is definitely going to be an eye-opening experience for you as you start to notice different topics that your students gravitate towards. And for me, every single year that I cover the exact same units, those student interests are always going to be slightly different and I will follow their lead. I also have to cover certain standards. So although we are guided by student interest, we're still being shaped by what we're required to teach through the curriculum standards. Part of my job during this in-between stage is to assess where the gaps in knowledge are and plan activities for students in order to fill those gaps in knowledge. 
It also makes, I also try to make sure that my activities are designed to not necessarily front load that information to students, but I try to design activities specifically so that students are able to discover the answers to some of their own questions. I like to use myself as mostly in the classroom, I am a guide as opposed to always being lecturing in the front of the classroom and giving students information. I really much prefer students to discover that information on their own. However, that doesn't mean that there's never an opportunity for direct instruction. That certainly happens, especially with some of the technical aspects of the curriculum, where really you just need to have those standard direct instruction lessons. And there's definitely still a place for those in an inquiry-based learning environment. One of the most important parts of inquiry in this in-between section is once the students are done an activity and they have discovered something new, that it is really imperative that as teachers, we give them a chance to share what they have learned and really have those reflective conversations where they are building their knowledge. That is where we solidify some of their hypothesis into actual learning. And we also want students to learn that they need to not just listen to the teacher and that the teacher isn't always going to be the person where they're going to learn from, but that they can also learn from one another and you're establishing a community of learners. So I'm just going to show you what some of those activities look like that happen on the in-between that allow me to do all of the things in this list. So for example, I take those questions and I create success criteria for my students. So this is an example of one that is up in my classroom right now as we're learning about government. The sticky notes that you see around the tart paper are my students' questions that we came up with to guide our final inquiry project. And these are the success criteria that students have to design what it is that they're learning and what they're doing, and we are covering those criteria. So we are currently working on that purple one, which is how do we elect our government, and specifically to tie into the election that's happening in our community right now, we're specifically looking at municipal elections because that's what we're electing. So students are working through different types of projects to be able to hit each one of those learning targets. Another strategy that I use often in this in-between section between Wonderwall and the Inquiry Project is things like collaborative note-taking. So giving a question and allowing students to write anywhere on that chart paper their answers to the question, and then bringing it back and using those reflective knowledge building circles. I really like that from here you have a visual representation of student thinking and you make sure that different voices are heard. It often gives some of those students that are reluctant to share out loud in a knowledge building circle. It gives them an opportunity to pre-plan what they want, might want to share and get their ideas down so that they can also contribute to that meaning. Some of the activities that I really like to use are the ones where students have to find out the answers to their own questions. So if I sh go back to the questions that they post here, giving them activities designed specifically that allows them to find the answers to their own questions is sometimes far more powerful than me just simply giving them the answers. Now, this is often harder for me because the easy road would just be simply to give them the answer or have them read something and answer some questions and I could quickly get an assessment out of that but I find the learning is less engaging that way and my students buy into far more the discovery type of learning the answer to their question as opposed to just me telling them for most cases. So for example, one of the activities I do in the human body is I give them, this is once it's actually already created, but they just get a page where you have all of the body parts separate. And their task is to research and figure out which of these parts are part of the digestive system and where exactly they go and figuring out what each piece is. Now there's task cards that go with each that describe what is the liver, what is the large intestine, and within those readings there may be clues that will help them to figure it out, but they're also going to need some third-party research to figure out how this digestive system is constructed. When you put this in a group of students and they have to figure it out, they will naturally try to work together to figure out what this is. Now, they may not work as a whole group, but generally speaking, they'll try to collaborate with one another and to try to figure it out because it's a mystery that needs to be solved. So I always like to see what this looks like when students are putting it together. 
And the best part is when they're done, they actually have a model of the digestive system. And it wasn't simply me giving them a pre-created model that they just had to kind of label. This is far more interactive, so they were a bit more engaged in this type of activity. So that's one of the ways that I like them to discover the answers to their own questions by giving them the pieces and then figuring out what the puzzle actually is and what it's supposed to look like when it's done. Another activity is task cards and task card sorts. So for this activity, students, I give them all of these different cards. They're not organized at all into food chain, but each one of the animals has a clue as to who eats it and what it eats. So they have about 30 different cards and each student gets a card and they have to try to circulate to find who else is in the food chain. Now, when they're done, they realize who is in their food chain, who eats what, and they also realize because there's multiple animals that are in different food chains that we understand that there's more of a, not necessarily a food chain, but we also can map out what a food web might look like as well. So I could simply just give them the food web or I can give them cards and they've got to put it together. Again, where they're discovering the answers to their own questions. Joy, I am so happy that you are finding the visuals so helpful. Um, I will be honest, I was asking a few of my friends what something they think I should add to my videos, and this is exactly what they've asked me to do or suggested that I do. So I'm really happy to see that you are finding them helpful. So I'm hoping to be able to do more of that so that you can see kind of what I'm talking about. So this is me trying. So I'm really appreciative that you like the visual. So thank you for sharing. So Another strategy that I have often used to help them discover their, so, sorry, that they can do this is I've done this the same with the human body as well. So I don't have a visual for this one, but it's the same kind of thing where I give them parts of the heart and they've got to figure out how they go together or parts of the blood and they have to create story and figure out the pieces and the people who are involved in the story. So there's different times where you're not giving them the answer, but you're giving them all of the clues that they're requiring in order to figure out what the answer is. And when you follow that up with a reflective conversation at the end, you have built knowledge and they have discovered it on their own, which sometimes is more powerful than simply you just telling them. And these kind of activities do lend well. I also like to introduce games and the fact that learning can be fun and that we can discover concepts without necessarily knowing what we're doing as we're doing it, but we can watch and kind of learn trial by error. So I love to put games and this is great for a quick assessment or to just check to see if they have learned some of the things that maybe you've been teaching them. So this is an example of levels of government that students can go through to make sure that they understand that different piece. And it also helps them to identify maybe gaps in their own learning and areas that they need to go to. So it's a good for quick self-assessment. It's great because sometimes I'll actually use these game questions in part of a quiz if I need to. So it helps with my assessment, but they also have a good time doing that. I have questions here that I've given them, but I also have had opportunities where they use the same exact game board and they can come up with their own questions to be able to add a few more and quiz a friend. Another example is using experiments. I absolutely love using experiments in science to make sure that students can learn different concepts. Sometimes the concepts are pretty um, advanced. So you want it to be coupled with kind of a consolidation of learning to see whether or not they can apply what's happening with, for example, this is the sponge. I don't think I actually have it. I think I actually took my sponge. Normally I had it in my desk drawer, but I don't think I do now. But on the sponge, I draw lines up, um, up and down. I think you can see my mouse. I draw line, uh, black line on the sponge. You'll see them over here in this example on the example card. Now, by simply just taking a sponge and bending the sponge, students see tension and compression for themselves right there. They see the lines on the top of the sponge spreading apart. They see the lines on the bottom of the sponge spreading or pushing together. When we're reading the article on tension and compression and then it's 
followed up directly by the experiment, it gives a real life example for students to be able to apply what it is they're learning to something that's right in front of them. So experiments and hands-on learning are definitely something that I think students need to be more involved in. This is one of my favorite activities to do, especially after I've done the sponge activity for tension and compression. And it also makes use of all of those textbooks that I'm sure we're using every single day or they're just collecting dust in our cupboards because they're so old. One of the two. But for me, this is probably the most use my textbooks get all year. And that is simply to build bridges. Now, I don't give my students any information prior to building this bridge. I simply just tell them there's textbooks in the cupboard and I spread my desks apart and I ask them to build a bridge out of the textbooks that spans between the two different desks, and I have tables now, but this is when I had desks, and they have to hold different weights. Now, I've had some groups that can build a bridge out of textbooks that have hold a human being, or they're simply just holding some of our weights, which is also a nice add into measurement as well. So this is something where this takes probably two periods. And it was one of the activities that really kind of helped me buy in to increase, and maybe that's why I love it so much. But I watched my students fail and fail a lot and collaborate and get frustrated and push through and persevere and move on. And it was one of those things where I watched them and I had to fight myself to not just jump in and save them, but to let them struggle through the learning going in and asking specific questions that would help them to think about some of the science that we had covered and the application of what they could do, but really getting my students to think through it and not save them and then watch them succeed at the end and kind of be thankful that I didn't always save them was really helpful for me as a teacher and also as a student. And now it's just a popular activity that we do they kind of they know it's coming because they look forward to it because they always see the grade the year before them doing it. So they look forward to it now every year. Another game, uh, this is a game that I play that helps students learn difficult concepts. Sometimes you've got things like the balance of an ecosystem. Those kind of things are really difficult to convey in an article and really to get students to understand the interplay and interrelationship between animal species and habitats and how they are fairly codependent. Getting them to play a role playing game is a really easy way to get them to see that relationship because they have to experience it. So putting them in a situation where they have to experience it, sometimes you can do that through a board game. I've seen this done, a physical game on a playground as well, but this is a great way to get students to see these difficult concepts by role playing them out. And I've done the same thing too with um, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms and role playing what those would look like. Now, I did say at the beginning that one of the most important pieces of this in between section between Wonder Walls and projects is going to be knowledge building and reflection. Now, this is really important because this is where you take just something they did and turn it into something they learned and making sure that they're getting the right information, that they are taking the right pieces out of the activity and having those conversations and listening to what it is they've learned. You get a ton of assessment in this section as well. And often that seems to be a big concern for teachers is okay, if I'm not doing tests and I'm not doing quizzes all of the time, or I don't have worksheets to mark, I don't have products to mark, what am I marking? These conversations, are a huge component of your assessment piece when it comes to inquiry. So I try to do one of these after every single major learning activity. We are in circle doing a knowledge building reflection almost two to three times a week sometimes where we are really just talking and sharing and communicating with one another and sharing kind of our opinions and what we've learned. And I can take notes. I can film it if I don't want to take notes and I can look at it later, but I can use the information that I gather based on what students are saying 
and perhaps I can collect their notes of what they're going to share because I often encourage them to take notes before we are ready for a knowledge building reflection circle and students will share that information. So these are not my classroom. These are just some photos of what a knowledge building circle generally look like that I have just found online. And I wanted to share just so that you had the visuals to see what knowledge building will sometimes look like. So it does often sit in a circle. And the reason for this is because you want everyone to understand the quality of their voice in that circle and you want to make sure that students are understanding that they're not just facing you when they all just turn and face you where there is a value to that in some learning in a knowledge building circle they're facing each other because you want them to understand that the learning happens as you're building community and it doesn't just happen by listening to the teacher talk so by sitting them in a circle which is really awkward for them at first they start to have private conversations off on the side and you really have to kind of coach and model what these conversations look like and they're tedious at the beginning because students don't really know what to do and eventually giving them the language and the sentence starters will help them to begin to communicate um, in a knowledge building circle. Today we had a breakthrough in one of our knowledge building circles. One of my students uh, when someone shared they put up their hand and when it was their turn to speak they said I'd really like to build on to what this person said I was so proud of that response because we've been practicing these sentence starters with students to how they can contribute in a meaningful way to a discussion as opposed to just always adding something new but they can also build on to what somebody else said and add more information so I was really proud to hear that for the first time of students using those sentence starters and those prompts to actually build on and contribute to a conversation. So that's what happens when you're knowledge building. And this is where you're asking students to share what they learned, to reflect on what other people have said, and to kind of consolidate and apply all those things they're learning to relate back to those success criteria that you have posted in your room. And you're relating back to that and say, can you prove to me through your reflections and through your conversations you understand that concept and that also really puts the learning of what you're doing the onus is on them they're not passive participants in this the best part about inquiry is that your students are active and they're involved and they're helping to create their own learning and they're contributing their ideas and you're listening to their ideas and they're definitely doing those things so you also want activities where their answer is discovered and uncovered. So because there's a lot of research that's going to go into the independent inquiry project at the end, there's always going to be a component of research and discovery. I like to throughout pre-plan some mini inquiry research projects that only take a day or so for students to contribute. So I'll give them things like animal adaptations where I give them a short text that they can read and I give them a research scaffolded organizer where they can learn to pull out the information to answer some of those questions and that's simply just teaching them to look for information and adding it now they can start with these pages but they can also find supplementary material to also add more information to their adaptation page for this activity Reading articles on the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and then looking at case studies is another way that I've done it. So there's a reading and then there's real life examples that students can then debate them debate through is another opportunity for students to share their learning. Sorting is my another one that I like to do because you're not giving them the rules, they're discovering the rules themselves on how things are sorted based on what they are seeing and they can sort those through things like solid liquids and gases are a great way because they are really kind of familiar with it. But once you have a collection of all things that are solid, all things that are liquid and all things that are gases, students can, be de can begin to discover the definition and come up with their own wording for the definition of each one of those properties. So sometimes not telling them what they are, but allowing them to sort things that are familiar and then coming, looking at the commonality between those things and having them sort them is sometimes very helpful.
So the one thing I think I'm hoping that you'll notice from these is a lot of these activities are not necessarily new or different. A lot of them are exactly the same that we have been using for a while. Sometimes we just shift the focus where we have students moving on from where they have, sometimes it's just a matter of shifting the focus. So that instead of you giving them the answer first, that they have to figure out what the, or giving them the question first, you have to give them the answers and they're figuring out what the questions are. But they're still the same type of activities, but you're allowing them a little bit of discovery and things where they have to figure out what the answer is without knowing all of the information. That There's a little bit of discovery. But sorting activities are not new, and diagrams are not new, and experiments are definitely not new. These are all kind of the things, the pieces that we put into place that allow our students to follow their own ideas and their questions. So we're still allowing them to lead, and we're focusing on the things that are important to them. We're allowing them to guide that learning, determine what the success criteria and the look for are for them to be figuring things out. We are planning activities that will fill in some of their gaps in knowledge so that they have the required background knowledge to participate in that final inquiry project that they themselves are going to design what it looks like. And you can simply ask them, okay, we've learned a few things, what are the things you need to know and how are you going to show me that you have learned enough in order to move on? And it's amazing that students can come up with some pretty solid ideas about what it is that they need to know and what it is they're able to show you about all of the things that they learn. So there's definitely some pretty traditional Things that are happening in that in-between stage, in between the Wonder Wall and the Inquiry Project. It's just a matter of reframing and tweaking a few things so that you can make it a bit more inquiry, a bit more discovery, so that you can help to follow students' lead, give them a bit more choice, and guide them along the path that they are meant to follow in order to discover new concepts and new learning. So I hope that gave you an idea of some of the things that you can do in that in-between stage where you start at your Wonderwall and you end at your inquiry project. I'm hoping that tonight's video helped you to see that some of the stuff that's happening in between isn't necessarily groundbreaking or even very new for many veteran teachers, but it's definitely doable if you just shift a few things in your mind about how you're presenting it to your students. So thanks so much for watching. If you want to know more information about tonight's video or maybe you want to catch it, figure out how you can catch it on the podcast, please go to the show's website at www.teachingwithinquiry.com and you can see tonight's video. You can catch the replay or follow along with previous videos through iTunes or through YouTube. All of the links that you'll need are on there, as well as a transcript from each one of the videos. And if you're interested in kind of getting started with Inquiry and you want more information, I have a free Inquiry course available on my website that is a six-week e or a session email course that comes straight to your inbox for free, and it goes through all of the different steps to get started with Inquiry-based instruction in your classroom. And you can get that at www.madlylearning.com. So thank you very much for joining me, and I will see you next week where we are continuing to figure out how to fit it all together and teaching with Inquiry. Thanks very much for watching. We'll see you next week. Bye.